and welcome. My name is Tamika Hobbs and I'm the Program and Education Coordinator here at the Library of Virginia and it is my great pleasure to welcome you here to the Library of Virginia for the wonderful event that we have planned this evening. Our special guests are Dwayne Betts. We'll be talking about his memoir, Question of Freedom. Um, and this event is one of many uh, that's a part of our ongoing public event series called our Book Talk Series and we've been pleasured and graced to uh, Host not a number of Virginia authors, ranging from David Baldacci to Adriana Trigiani. Uh, last fall, we had the great privilege of hosting uh, Annette Gordon Reed, who went on to win a National Book Award and a Pulitzer Prize. And we're definitely honored to have Dwayne uh, be a part of that roster. So, welcome to him. Um, we look forward to hearing from him later. Um, while I have your attention, I did want to bring a few things to your uh, note. Uh, if you walked in the lobby, you would have noticed that we do have a new exhibition on the life of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, this uh, year represents the 200th anniversary of his birth, and we have partnered with the Edgar Allan Poe Museum here in town to recognize and commemorate that anniversary. Uh, and to that point, on this Saturday, Saturday, August 15th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., we'll be hosting our uh, Family Day event that will be themed around the Edgar Allan Poe exhibition. So if you have young people in your life, we invite you back uh, for that event on this Saturday. Uh, before I turn the program over, I'd like to recognize a number of our event co-sponsors. Uh, when I discovered or ran across Dwayne's book, the first call I made was to the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia, and they readily and, and willingly um, agreed to co-sponsor tonight's event. So I want to recognize uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Stacy Burrs, all the wonderful staff there that has been helping with this project, Todd Elliott, Evans Hopkins, uh, and so many others. Uh, also on that same note, I'd take this opportunity to recognize the Congressman, uh, U.S. Congressman Robert Bobby Scott, who's here with us. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, another one of our co-sponsors uh, was the Campaign for Youth Justice. Eric Solomon is here with us this evening. We appreciate all of their support, as well as Kate Duvall and the many partners that are represented by the Families and Allies for Youth Justice uh, and Just Children. And on that note, the next voice that you will hear will be Andrew Block, who is the legal director for Just Children, who will do us the great honor of introducing the congressman, uh, Andrew Block. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Good evening. I want to thank the library and the, and the museum for helping make this happen, and of course, Congressman Scott and, and Dwayne for being here tonight. Uh, I'm the legal director of the Just Children Program, which is part of the Legal Aid Justice Center, which has offices in Charlottesville, Petersburg, and Richmond. And we're an advocacy organization and do a lot of work on behalf of kids who are in the juvenile justice system, both helping individual kids and also working on systemic issues. And before I move to the introductions, I, I want to just say that if you are motivated or inspired by what you hear tonight, there's plenty of work that's going on in Virginia to help make these systems serve our young people better than they do right now. And Kate Duvall, I'm not sure where Kate is, she's in the back, she's waving her hand, and then Lee, who's with Just Children, and then Leanne Rizel, who's standing up, and they each have a little button that says, don't throw away the key on it, so you'll know who they are. Um, but they would love to get your contact information, and so we can be in touch with you because there's a lot of important work in the months ahead that we all need your help on to help make lives better for Virginia's young people. Someone who's been a lifelong champion for Virginia's young people and indeed the country's young people is Congressman Robert Scott who's here tonight and I want to welcome him and thank him. He has sat in the House of Delegates, he sat in the Virginia State Senate, and he's now serving his ninth term as a congressman from Virginia. He chairs the subcommittee on crime in the, in the House Courts Committee. And from that vantage point, he has been really the greatest advocate we could ask for in terms of protecting kids who are in the juvenile justice system. He he's, has a bill that he's sponsored right now. It's called the Youth Promise Act that wants facts, not fear, to drive our policy for our children, and reality, not rhetoric, to, to help us think about what our policies should be. He has 
I, another bill that he sponsored called Every Student Counts, I think I have that name right, to make sure that we're not pushing kids out in our, in our effort to make accreditation and comply with No Child Left Behind. And he says every kid should count, and we can't send them to the curb in our efforts to make our schools nicer places to be. We couldn't be more fortunate to have him here. We couldn't be more fortunate to have him representing the people of Virginia. And I could go on and on about his accomplishments, but I think it's better just to introduce him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is somebody, is, do we need to uh, get this up? Okay. Find some high tech. Uh, sounds like it's happening. Well, in the meanwhile, uh, thank you, thank you, Andy, and thank you for the uh, good work that you're that you're doing, and all of the others that are here in juvenile justice. Uh, Liz Ryan um, has done a tremendous job uh, with uh, her organization, and Ms. Turner has been doing a whole lot of stuff with uh, gun, gun violence, so there are a lot of people here that have been doing a whole lot. And we certainly look forward to Dwayne's remarks because he has actually put a face on, um, uh, on the um, uh, situation of trying more juveniles as adults. Uh, one of the things that um, I have found as a member of uh, the state legislature and a member of the uh, uh, member of Congress uh, particularly since I've been chairing the uh, crime subcommittee, is that uh, crime policy is not complicated after you've made a choice. Uh, you have to choose whether your goal is to reduce crime or play elective politics. You can't do both. We're good at both. But once you made your decision, it's uh, pretty easy to, uh, to know what to do. Are you going to call this up? Are you working on it? Okay. Um, we'll um, get the high tech working in just a minute. Um, yep. So. I hate it when this happens. We got it all set up and it's on the screen here. Um, choice in terms of playing politics or reducing crime and we, we're really good at both because we can reduce uh, we can play politics and that's the emotional approach the mandatory minimum sentences life without parole three strikes and you're out and if it rhymes it's even better policy if it's uh, if it rhymes it's even better policy uh, because if you if you do the adult crime you do the adult time now the one, the one policy I like better than any others is the one that says um, no cable TV in the prisons. You can just imagine the cable guy going to the prison, disconnecting the cable, and everybody in the community sits back and watches the crime rate go down all over the community. I mean, some of these things actually pass off as, uh, as crime policy. Uh, but we know better than that. And, and one that you're working on, Andy, and uh, one that we need to be working on, we're going to hear a lot more about today, is uh, trying more juveniles as adults. Not only is that uh, bad policy generally inhumane, it doesn't make any sense. 
Now we know that when you do that, every study that's been done has shown that if you try more juveniles as adults, the crime rate will go up. Crimes will be committed sooner, more likely to be violent, and add insult to injury. Uh, the children subjected to the adult system are more likely to be endangered, and to add more insult to injury, it's usually applied in a discriminatory manner. And yet, it runs 70 percent of the polls and people brag about their support for trying more juveniles as adults. Uh, some, uh, they, they say they're cracking down on crime. There's one study in Florida where a judge studied 4,500 cases in terms of, uh, uh, of trying more juveniles as adults. And when they got to the adult system, 85 percent of the people they cracked down on and sent to adult court walked out of court. Either, either not guilty, or probation, parole, or whatever, walk out of court. Now, uh, they're more likely, in many cases, to get a longer sentence as a juvenile than as an adult. And if you look at uh, what happens, you get the juvenile court judge who looks at somebody in there on a first offense burglary, and uh, on burglary, and they look and they've been uh, guilty of uh, curfew violations, truancy, underage drinking, a long list of violations, and that here on burglary, that's a pretty much slam dunk gone to Beaumont. If in adult court, the status offenses don't count as prior criminal offenses, they're in adult court on first offense burglary, uh, most lawyers can uh, walk you out of court with probation. Likely to get time as a juvenile, probation as an, as an adult. So you have a situation where you're not even likely to get more time, but certainly, since the adult court can either lock you up with adult murderers, robbers, drug dealers, and thugs as your associates for a little while, the juvenile court judge can order education, psychological services, even family services, so it doesn't surprise anybody that when the dust settles, those are more who are treated as adults are more likely to get in trouble quickly. Uh, so here you have a situation that doesn't make any sense, and thank you, Andy, for the work that you're doing in making that, uh, doing something about it. But all of this emotional approach has done one thing. It's got us to be the uh, number one uh, incarcerator in the world. And you really have to watch the chart. This is a chart of every country you can name, India, Indonesia, Germany, Japan, Italy, France, South Korea, uh, all the countries you can name. The big bar at the end is Russia, about 600 and some per 100,000. The uh, number one in the world is the United States, 700 and some per 100,000. Uh, rivaled only by Russia is anywhere close, but number one, and we've been number one for several years. Now, we're at 720 some per 100,000. Uh, the Pew Research Forum did a study uh, that was released earlier this year that said anything over 500, anything over 300 is diminishing returns, anything over 500 is actually counterproductive. You are injecting more social pathology and crime into the community by having that many people with that, those kinds of uh, criminal records, that kind of unemployment rate and everything else that goes along with it. You are actually increasing the crime rate, anything over 500. We're at 721. But the real insult to injury is the African-American incarceration rate, 2,200 on average, 10 states, it's close to 4,000. Now when you look at this graph, some people say, well, I see the problem, we're not locking up enough black people. And they want to have an emotional approach and lock up more and more people. Um, the emotional approach has created that graph uh, lock them up, throw away the key, codify slogans and sound bites. We know, on the other hand, how to reduce crime. If you have a continuum of services for young people, from the very earliest until they get to college or on the job, you can reduce crime. And when I say early, I mean real early, before they're born, so teen pregnancy prevention, so fewer babies are born into dysfunctional families, and then prenatal care to reduce mental retardation and learning disabilities, and then nurse visits, which can significantly reduce child abuse, which is highly correlated with future crime. They've studied the nurse visitation programs, and they reduce crime so much that it saves more money than it costs. Early childhood education, 
uh, Head Start, uh, make sure they can read by the third grade. Uh, reading experts tell me that up to the third grade you learn to read. After the third grade, you read to learn. You can't read by the third grade. You can't learn after the third grade. And you're on a trajectory to dropping out. Uh, after school programs, college access programs, those are things that get young people on the right track and keep them on the right track. Uh, we know that um, if you get, if you drop out of school, for African American, this chart is African American males, 26 to 30. Purple is high school dropout, green is a high school graduate. 1970 didn't make that much difference. You can get a low skill job and uh, get a job, few are not in the labor force, a handful in jail. By 2000, however, We've got a high-tech economy, information-based economy. If you don't have a good education, you can't get a job. According to this study in 2000, African-American males who dropped out of school, only one-third, less than one-third of them, have a job. A lot more employed if you have a high school graduation. But look at not in the labor force and in jail, almost as many or more than working. In fact, if you look very closely, you'll see African-American males 26 to 30 are more likely to be found today in jail than working, according to the study. So if you, have not, if you don't have the continuum of services to get young people on the right track and keep them on the right track, if they drift off and go off uh, and, and, and become a high school dropout, you can see exactly uh, where they're headed. That's why the Every Student Count uh, bill is so important because it requires, as a condition of adequate yearly progress, adequate yearly progress under No Child Left Behind, that you have a low dropout rate. That you can't let people drop out and think, if you educate those that are left, that you did anything. No, you got to educate everybody because every student counts. Now, the uh, we have a choice, as I indicated. Uh, we can have the present system, which uh, high incarceration rate or we can have a prevention, early intervention approach where you get people on the right track and keep them on the right track. The present system is so bad right now that the Children's Defense Fund calls it the cradle to prison pipeline. So many people are born on the way to prison. If we don't do anything different than we're doing now, we can expect one-third of the young black boys born today to be on the way to prison, about one-third. And we know we can do better than that because if we uh, create not a cradle to prison pipeline, but a cradle to college pipeline, making sure they all have the services or cradle to the workforce pipeline that they can do a lot better. Now, we know um, that this debate is going on right now. And people say, well, we, you can't afford the uh, programs. Well, let's um, see where, um, where the money is. Uh, we reduce the African American incarceration rate that we showed you from 2200 to 500 which is the maximum that you can lock people up at before you get into counterproductive uh, that would be a reduction of 17 in a community of 100,000 people to 1700 fewer people incarcerated almost 50 million dollars worth in a city uh, half the size of the city of Richmond uh, there are about 30,000 children out of 100,000 population and do the arithmetic, that's $1,600 per child per year that those communities are wasting in counterproductive incarceration and if you actually targeted the money to the one-third of the most vulnerable children you're up to almost $5,000 per child per year that you're spending. Ten states on the other hand, worst ten states at 4,000 per 100,000. Uh, that would be 3,500 fewer people incarcerated. And that, uh, those communities, they're wasting about $100 million per year in counterproductive incarceration. 30,000 children do the arithmetic. That's about $3,800, $3,300 per child per year wasted in counterproductive incarceration. And if you actually targeted that money to the one-third of the children, that desperately need it, you could spend $10,000 per child per year in what some communities are wasting in counterproductive, in, in counterproductive incarceration. 
Now you wonder, what kind of community would decide to spend money in counterproductive incarceration rather than spend up to $10,000 a year per child? What kind, of, what kind of people are those? Well, there are people in 10 states in the United States of America today. And it's because we're taking the action that we're taking today that we're trying to change that mentality and have people pointed uh, in the right direction. This debate is going on in Congress today. There are two uh, bills dealing with uh, gang violence. One that uh, Andy has mentioned, the Youth Promise Act, that funds programs, uh, comprehensive programs to reduce youth violence. We require the community to come together. Everybody's got anything to do with, with young children come together. That's uh, obviously law enforcement, but the school system, uh, after school programs, boys and girls clubs, uh, faith-based community, foster care, mental health, everybody has anything to do with children. Get them around the table and first decide what your problem is and then what are the evidence-based, not slogan-based, evidence-based solutions to your problem. And one of the things you put on the table to begin with how much money are you spending on prisons? And if you've got a community of 100,000 uh, 100, people and they are now wasting $100 million a year and you can cut that uh, rate in half, you ought not limit your imagination to programs that cost $15,000 a year. Uh, you might want to think in terms of programs that cost $10 million and $20 million. In Los Angeles County, when they put that number in the middle of the table, to have there to people watch uh, during the discussion, uh, Los Angeles County spends about five billion dollars a year in incarceration. Five billion. What they send to the state and what the local sheriff has to lock up, about five billion dollars. And if you hired a hundred thousand children with summer jobs, a hundred thousand at three thousand dollars each, that'd be a hundred million. You're trying to get cutting it half, two and a half billion. I mean, you can't, you, you can't spend the money. Because if you had that many summer jobs, they would be running summer camps and everything else. You'd have every kid in the, uh, in, in, in the neighborhood uh, with constructive things to do with their time. You'd have, uh, you'd, you'd have everybody uh, with Head Start. And everybody, every, all the way from uh, preconception to college, they would have things to do with their time. And we can afford it with the money that's on the table. So the Youth Promise Act would get people on the right track, keep them on the right track. All, every time they've done one of these, it saves more money than they, than they spend. Pennsylvania, they spent $60 million in programs around the state. A couple of years later, they looked back and found that they had, they had saved $300 million. Spent 60, saved 300. In Boston, they reduced the number of juvenile murders, which is one a month for about 12 a year, for years. They came together. They eliminated, they didn't have a youth murder for three consecutive years. In a program, a comprehensive program here in Richmond neighborhood, they had 17 murders the year before. After they came together, two murders, cost two and a half million dollars. If you ask the Medical College of Virginia, uh, they probably saved two and a half million dollars in uncompensated uh, care for gunshot victims because so many fewer people were showing up in the emergency room in the trauma unit. Uh, we can save more money than we spend if we put these together. But unfortunately, as I indicated, there's a debate going on. There's another uh, theory of how to deal with uh, juvenile justice, and that's the gang abatement bill, which, um, just to give you a few provisions in it, it defines gang members, uh, which in practice is always going to be racially discriminatory. It defines it has more juvenile life without parole, uh, possibilities, uh, juvenile life without parole, we're the only country on earth known to sentence juveniles to life without parole for, th for crimes committed as juveniles, only one on earth. Um, and it has severe punishments, let me just give you one, if you get caught committing a violent crime that is not serious, try to think of a violent crime that is not serious. Sounds like something that would happen in the cafeteria. You throw a banana at somebody or something. Violent crime, not serious. Under the bill, you can get up to 20 years to serve in the federal system. Now, people were marching all in the street about the Gina Six because they beat a guy. Uh, he ended up in a hospital. Well, maybe that was serious. Oh, well, he was at a party later that night. Maybe it wasn't serious. If they can show it wasn't serious, 
they could be looking at 20 years to serve. Um, that debate is going on now, but I want to thank Andy and everyone else here for the work that you do because you help add some common sense to criminal justice policy. Uh, you can show that uh, if you go in a more intelligent direction, not only will you reduce crime, you'll save money, and it's a much more humane way of doing business than codifying slogans and sound bites that only run up the incarceration rate, waste the taxpayers' money, and for those juveniles caught up in the system, uh, it has been shown that their life options are severely restricted when they get caught up in the system. And that is particularly egregious when they're sent there on, pro, on, on, on procedures that tend to be racially discriminatory, waste the taxpayers' money, don't do any good, when there are cost-effective alternatives to incarceration for juveniles. So we look forward, Andy, to your good work. We look forward to Dwayne and listening to what you're going to say, because say, he's going to put a face on how bad the system is and what we need to do. So thank you very much, and thank you for your good work. Like I said, we're, we're lucky to have Congressman Scott. Can we give him another round of applause? Before I introduce our next speaker, I just want to briefly recognize uh, someone else who we're lucky to have in Virginia which is our current director of the Department of Juvenile Justice, Barry Green, who's in the, in the back row. And, and Barry runs all the programs, uh, <laughs> both probation and, and prisons, and, and we have seen since his role in this, since his leadership, we've seen a lot of improvements in the system. And, and he's very sensitive to all the issues that Congressman Scott is talking about, and I think we're lucky to have him here. Congressman Scott is obviously a tough act to follow, but I, but I suspect that our next speaker is up to it. Uh, Dwayne Betts is here. You probably all read the flyer and read something about him. I'll be real brief. He, uh, he grew up in Maryland. He, at the age of 16, drew some bad circumstances, and, and he can tell you more, but probably bad choices. He got involved in some serious stuff and ended up doing time in, in some of Virginia's harshest adult prisons. And he was there until his mid-20s and was released and has spent all his time since then trying to make sure that other people don't follow that path, making sure that he leads a life that is, that is worthy of, of following and celebration and, and replication. He, he teaches creative writing workshops. He's, he's, gotten young people in the city of, of Washington involved in, in creative outlets and creative expression. He's won scholarships both at community college and at, at the University of Maryland, and I think was just recently the commencement speaker at the University of Maryland from where he graduated. And I'll let him do the rest, but uh, please welcome Dwayne Betts. So it's a pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me? This is a huge audience too. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to speak before the step director of the CIA, Panetta, at the graduation, and that was a great honor. And now I get the opportunity to follow Congressman Bobby Scott, and it's a great honor because I was aware of the Promise Act and all the good work you do. And as a 16-year-old, when I carjacked the man and I ended up pleading guilty and getting incarcerated, I had no idea that there were people like you, Congressman, people like Liz, who were actually interested in my life. I had no idea that one day I would get to write a book and have this many people that was willing to listen to what I had to say. And um, it's, it's a blessing that I never expected, and I thank you all for taking the time to hit me out. Um, so I wrote my book in three sections. The first section is called The New World. And each section sort of starts with an epigraph by another writer because my book is very much about literature. It's very much about prison, but it's very much about the importance and power of literature. So the first thing you read is a quote from a Walt Whitman poem called Song of Myself. This hour I tell things in confidence. I may not tell everybody, but I will tell you. 30 minutes. 
16 years hadn't even done a good job on my voice. It cracked in my head as I tried to explain away the police car driving my 126 pounds to the Fairfax County Jail. Everything near enough for me to touch gleam with the color of violence. The black of the deputies horse the guns, the broken leather of the seat I sat on, and the silver of the cuffs that held my hands before me in prayer. When I closed my eyes, I thought about the way the gun felt in my palm. I tried to remember what caliber pistol it was, but couldn't. It was automatic, it weighed nothing in my palm, and I couldn't figure how something that weighed nothing could have me slumped in the back of a car, driving me away from my life. My wrist almost slipped through the cuffs that held me captive as jailhouse dangers swirled in my head. I want to tell you that I could talk tough, that I was going over every way to say back up off me, but I wasn't. There were titles of movies and books on my mind. Shawshank Redemption, American Me, Blood In Blood Out, Makes Me Wanna Holler, Race Horse, The Autobiography of Malcolm X. Every movie or book I'd ever read about prison bled with violence and I knew the list I was making in my head could go on forever. Stories of robbery, rape, murder, discrimination, and what it means not to be able to go home. 16 years old and I was headed to a jail cell, adding my name to the toll of black men behind bars. Not even old enough to buy liquor or cigarettes, but I knew I'd be stepping into the county jail in minutes and that my mom's was at home somewhere crying. When I tried to part my hands, I thought about the violence, about how real it is when a cell door closes behind you at night. I thought about needing a knife, cause from what I knew, Everyone needed a knife. I stared at my shackled feet. I was getting ready to learn what it meant to lock your thoughts inside of yourself and survive in a place governed by violence. A place where violence was a cloud of smoke you either learned to breathe or choked on. Sometimes there's a story that's been written again and again. Sometimes a person finds himself with a story he thinks will be in vogue forever. The story is about redemption about overcoming. A person finds that story and starts to write it, thinking it would do him some good to tell the world how it really was. That's not this story. This is about silence and how in an eight year period I met over a dozen people named Juvenile or Youngin or Shorty. All nicknames to tell the world that they were in prison as young boys, as children. We wore the names like badges of honor. Because in a way, for some of us, it was all we had to guard us against the fear. And we were guilty. And I was just like everyone else. I thought about the edge of a knife. And so, you know, what I wanted to do was write a book that was about prison and write a book that was about my experiences without writing a book that tried to paint everybody in prison as a demon or a monster. I wanted to somehow give some humanity to what was my question of freedom and how I pursued it. And the thing that always came up was my father. You know, I must have went to prison because I didn't have a father in the house. And it was news to me at 16 that I was doomed since I didn't have a father. And I sort of wanted to address that. So the second chapter is called Things I Know and Don't Know About My Father. My father is a convicted felon. He's a smart man and went to college. Old Dominion University. Because he lived in D.C. and no one has ever told me I come from rich people, he must have gotten a scholarship. He could swim for days and for years taught people to swim with the public parks and recreation folks. He never taught me to swim, to throw a left hand, or to value the way something you can say can make people pay attention. I couldn't tell you the name of my father's father. I'm told that my grandfather was the son of a Cherokee woman, but I couldn't prove it. My grandfather could bump into me on an empty street in any city in America and I wouldn't recognize him. And even though I met my mother's father, the only things I know about the man is that I've never seen him in a room with my grandmother and that he loves James Brown. The men in my family had disappeared before I was old enough to know they were missing and if the wrong person speaks, he will cite that as the reason why I went to prison. Something in my blood that turns foolishness into felonies. 
That's what I thought about when I walked into the jail. If I wanted to talk, I talked to myself. I couldn't tell you the name of anyone in my family older than 55 the morning I was arrested. But I never told a judge, a lawyer, or a cop anything about myself. The only thing that was important to them was the gun I pulled on a man sleeping in his car. And I understood that. The circumstances of the crime, the color of the jacket I wore, and even the caliber pistol I held were only important in the way they contributed to me walking into the Fairfax County Jail with cuffs on. One day, the juvenile court judge asked, Are you aware that your charges carry a life sentence? The only person in the crowd I knew was my mother. She taken off work, and every time the lawyer or judge spoke to me, they were speaking to her. And every time the judge mentioned my crime, my mom's face said I was crushing her. The crowd got quiet when the judge asked this question. And I wanted to ask him what he thought I could do with a life sentence. You see, a life sentence puts age into perspective. It meant I wouldn't shovel snow from the sidewalk before my mother's house again. That I wouldn't dribble my basketball down Silver Hill Road on the way to the library. It meant the sisters I met just... It meant... The, it meant the sisters I met just before getting locked up. The ones who stood bright eyed and anxious as I talked to my father for the first time in 12 years wouldn't know my favorite ice cream was butter pecan. And my mother would spend more time than she had wondering where she went wrong. I have no idea where my father was when the judge spoke to me. I ignored everyone who tried to warn me away from the streets. I thought there was an imaginary line that would keep me safe. If I stood on corners but didn't sell crack, I'd be okay. If I smoked weed but did well in school, I'd be okay. I couldn't wrap my mind around a life sentence, but I walked into a world where I was either a good kid or a super predator that the world had to fear. I walked into a world where people looked at me the way they looked at my father. Maybe. It's hard to construct a life off scraps off loose pieces of information. I heard my father jump out a third floor window and walked away. That he once pulled a machete on a man in anger. I heard these stories after I was locked up. Before prison, my father got judged by his absence. It was almost the way the judge judged me, except the judge was concerned with my presence. All he needed to know was that there was a victim who said I pulled a gun on him and a police detective who agreed. Those were the facts that said life sentence. That's not this story though. It's not about my father being absent or the stories about the men in my family I don't know. That story is an old story. I saw it played out in the streets when the street light still signaled that I needed to go outside, that I needed to go inside. It's on the news and books. Close your eyes and hit sirens well as cops draw guns and somebody's brother, son, husband is going away in cuffs. To cuff is to smack someone upside the head or slam steel bracelets over their wrists. Anyone who doesn't know the story of cuffs and black men can walk into any de juvenile detention center in America, any jail or any prison and see the same thing. A rack of black bodies. Men walking around those small confined spaces like they own them because in a way they do. The time behind bars connected me to the lives of black men, to their stories and their silences. I found my father's life somewhere behind bars. My father and I share a history of not knowing. And this history is more important in a way than the one I had with the family I do know. Because the only one who knows what the inside of a jail cell smells like is him. My father knows that there was a man that made a victim. What I've never told him is this. There was a victim and it was that night his eyes opened wider than silver dollars. I'd have had, I had a pistol in my palm for the first time. And I knew that meant nothing. I knew that if the victim ever spoke, he would tell the judge how I looked like the man who had pointed a pistol toward his forehead. He would say he thought about his mother as he got out of the car and that he thought about his girlfriend. He would tell the judge that he thought about his daughter, if he had one. If he spoke, he would have talked about imagining his life ending as a bullet smashed through his skull, and he would say that as he stepped out of the car, he thought it was a joke. If he talked, I would have listened. 
and maybe even known that there was nothing I could say to make my mother understand what he said. I was in a jail because I had been certified as an adult. I doubt my father knew what that meant in 1996. My mother didn't know, my grandmother didn't know, and none of my aunts knew. Ask someone how many juveniles are in prisons or jails during time with adults. Most people will look at you like you said something crazy. They don't know that there were at least a dozen juveniles at Fairfax County Jail the morning I arrived. Certified. It's a legal hocus pocus where the prosecuting attorney made my 16-year-old body an adult by the signing of a piece of paper. Truth is, I confessed before the police talked to me for 10 minutes. I tried to lie to talk my way out of it, but in the end, all I did was confess. Um, so I'm going to read two more sections. And, and the thing is, like in that part, I really need people to understand that I understand that I was guilty. And I understand that whenever I get an audience this large, there's somebody in here who has been made a victim. There's somebody in here who has a family member that was a victim. And I try to confront the fact that having made somebody a victim, it's not easy to get over that. But I also try to present in this book a world in which I think all of us will understand a 16-year-old is not meant to survive. I'm just fortunate to be here right now. And um, this next part I'm going to read, I went to court. I was facing 23 years of life because carjacking carries 15 to life, robbery carries 5 to 40, and a gun carries a mandatory minimum of 3 years. I was sentenced to the, the minimum for each charge, so 15, 5, and 3, which is 23. And then we had some legal hocus pocus going on, and I ended up having to serve a 9 year sentence. So at the section of the book I'm in now, I've been sentenced by the court. In the book I talk about how everybody, even my family, stood up and was like, he did it because he didn't have a father. Then I talk about how I had to stand up and say, you know, Your Honor, I apologize for what happened. I can't explain it, but I didn't do it because I didn't have a father. And um, so anyway, this is sort of like the section. So this is the section where my mom comes to see me after the sentencing. Time's heaviness. After I was sentenced, time was all I thought about. I was 16 and headed to prison for nine years which meant there would be no prom, no first night driving down Silver Hill Road, no going off to college. The time meant my life was different and would change in ways I couldn't imagine. I remember the first time after the sentencing, my mother came to see me. The visiting room was still, and when I walked in, I might as well have been holding a clock with no hands. The phone in my mother's hand was scuffed and her knuckles strained against the black, but when she saw me, she kissed her hand and placed it on the glass where my hand waited. What's more painful to a mother than to stare at her only son behind glass in a jail's visiting room? Around us, the people talked about diapers, about appeals, about the deputy that split Swan's head open for nothing. I heard it, but it washed over me like the judge's voice passing down my sentence. I heard it all, but couldn't make out the sense of it, and all the while I was drowning in the sounds. The face of the judge was in front of me. His face was behind my eyes. My mother was aging before me and her smiles were gone. She had come right after I was sentenced, right after the judge told the court he was under no illusion sending me to prison would help me. So, I'm gonna end with the epilogue because I'm just getting sad, right? So, <laughs> so um, you know, at some point it get better, but like I said, I wanted people to read the book and have to think about prison. But then I realized when I got released that it was this thing called collateral consequences, right? Which I think is like a euphemism that we probably shouldn't even use. So let's just say it's this thing called the irrevocable and irreparable harm that continues to happen to people who have been convicted of felonies once they're released. And I wanted to write an epilogue about that and about some other stuff. So epilogue is short, and then we'll have a brief question and answer, and then you know, if anybody wants to buy a book, I love to sign. Epilogue. Almost every one of my moments outside of prison has been filled with me fighting to be defined by something other than prison. I learned to meet people and lean into conversations with an admission of guilt. You know, I got locked up when I was younger. I thought I had to tell people because not to tell them was to lie. I met my wife Therese in Caribou Books in Bowie, Maryland. It was a Monday and we were both students at Prince George's Community College. In a conversation with her months later, I found myself leaning into the truth. You know, 
At 16, I got locked up. The confession always sounds like a joke at first. People rarely believe me the first time. My wife told me she never expected to be involved with someone who'd been to prison. Yet I've always wanted to be with someone like her. A person that judges me by who I am and not what I did. My life has been built in the moments of hoping people will judge me by my character and not my past. Two years after I was released from prison, I sat in Howard University's Office of Admissions. The head of the Honors Academy, Dr. Melinda Thomas, and five of my fellow students were with me. This was further away from prison than I'd expected to be. We were all, as a part of Prince George's Community College's Honors Academy, to receive full tuition scholarships to Howard University. It was simply a matter of signing a sheet of paper. When it was my turn to sign a slip of paper, my right forearm weighing down on the brown table, I paused. The scholarship agreement had the dreaded question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? When I told the admissions officer that I had to answer yes, the scholarship became dust sifted through my hands. Don't worry, it's just a formality. Once the committee meets, we'll get back to you. Don't be concerned, the woman told me. But I understood what it meant. I wasn't going to get away from my carjacking conviction just because I'd be graduating from community college with a 3.5 GPA. Was president of my school's chapter Phi Theta Kappa, editor of the literary journal, and had been featured on the front cover of the Washington Post for Young Men Read, a book club I co-founded for young boys. My face fell back into a solitary cell as she told me not to worry. And she told me that they'd get back to me. They have never gotten back to me. A few days later, I received an email from the Atlantic offering me the opportunity to apply to their prestigious internship. The residue of my experience with Howard was still in the air. So before I applied, I told the people at the Atlantic that I was convicted of a felony when I was 16. I wanted them to cross me off their list if that was a problem. They didn't. And I ended up getting one of their internships. The other students were all attending prestigious schools like Yale, Harvard, NYU. I smiled when I told people I'd attended Prince George's Community College. I heard all the jokes about community college being the 13th grade. But I was proof that the education there prepared me to compete on the highest level. I was working in a Watergate building months after being rejected by Howard University and I thought that there might be a chance my prison sentence could disappear if I wanted it to. I thought that I could pretend it didn't happen. After the internship at the Atlantic, the University of Maryland awarded me a Transfer Academic Excellence Scholarship, a full tuition scholarship. In both cases, the scholarship and internship wasn't despite my incarceration, but because the respected committees felt I was one of the best applicants. Just as the summer ended, I sat down with Mr. Westcott, one of the editors at the Atlantic. In my pocket, I carried a picture to raise my fiance and my son, Makai, who was smiling in his stroller beside me. They were reminders of how far I truly come. Before I had a chance to speak, Mr. Westcott told me, you know, I was carjacked in front of my house. I didn't know what to say. He knew about my crime and about the book I write. He never used the crime against me. He never brought it up at work, even though we had a few conversations about the book. Every moment, even as I get further and further away from prison, I have to deal with what it means to have made someone a victim. I like to think that, as I sat at the table with Mr. Westcott and we talked about my book, he saw that I redeemed myself. Talking to him gave me a chance to realize that there are people who are willing to judge me by who I have become and not by a moment of insanity. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Earlier today I had the opportunity to speak at the Richmond Juvenile Detention Center 
And um, I see some folks that were there and that actually bought books there and came out again. So I really appreciate it. Um, I told myself I'd make this announcement before questions. I went to Beaumont too and I spoke as well. And um, we left some books at Beaumont. They, they um, purchased a few books for the kids there. Actually purchased 16 books. And that's thanks to the organization that's behind Don't Throw Away the Key at the Richmond Juvenile Detention Center. We weren't able to leave as many books. We left two books. And if there's anybody here that's willing to, that's interested in buying a book for somebody that's incarcerated in one of the juveniles, then they can do that and we'll get the books to Leanne and make sure they get it because, like honestly, you know, if you read my book, my book is about the power of literature to change lives. And literature that's unread changes no one's lives. Literature that never gets placed in a person's hands can change no one's lives. So I hope that regardless if you buy the book or you get it from the library or you get another book from the library that we all take it upon ourselves to encourage more people to read. Because as he said, if you know you can't read by the third grade, you know, afterwards you can't learn. And I think that's like one of the most powerful things I've heard all week. So thanks and any questions, um We'll just ask that if you would wait for the microphone before you read your question. And secondly, if you have any cards for the drawing, please go ahead and pass those either to that side or this, and we'll collect those. There's somebody in the back. Hi, my name is Jennifer Asante. I really enjoyed your speech. I'd just like to know, when you were released from incarceration, did you seek any counseling? And how soon after, no, or how I, long did your counseling last in order to get transitioned back into society? I, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, eight and a half years in prison, I talked to one mental health specialist seven years in. Um, I thought it was an insult that he asked if I ever thought about suicide seven and a half years into my sentence. I thought it was insane, so our conversation didn't go too well. Um, when I came home, I didn't I didn't seek out counseling. The only time I've had counseling is I had merged counseling, and I was just fortunate enough to be able to make the transition in the society, you know, without that. I probably still need counseling, but I was fortunate enough to be able to do okay without it. Dwayne, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I heard you uh, with the group earlier, and someone asked you uh, this question, and I love your response, and I think it's worth asking before the crowd. Did prison make you the man that you are today? Okay, so it was a kid that asked me the question, right, so I couldn't really get offended because he was like 13. But um, I irrevocably, you know, I stand firm on this response, right? Prison did not make me the man I am today. You know, it, it didn't in no way. I had a high school diploma when I went to prison. There were no educational opportunities for me. There were no vocational opportunities for me. There was no treatment for me at all. Prison is the most violent, insane place I've ever been, but I was fortunate enough to meet men who helped me nourish myself, who helped me nurture myself. I became a man in prison, yes, but prison did not make me who I am today. I'm here, grace of God, the goodwill, of some, of some inmates who hadn't gone all the way crazy based on what the system does to us, but in no way, in no way, in no way at all would I allow the Virginia Department of Corrections to take any credit at all for anything that I'm doing with my life. I, I was wondering how your relationship with your mother is today. Um. So, no, I mean, we're cool, but this is the thing. You can't get away from the fact that, you know, I can't get away from the fact that not only did I make a man a victim, right, but I made my mother a victim. So, yeah, I've been fortunate enough to be on TV, be on the news, and people usually say, you know, man, I'm proud of you, that's great, you know, good job, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you're proud. My mom calls me and says, you know, son, you know how much I love you, you know, I'm, I'm real proud of you. Don't nobody know what I went through when you were locked up. And she doesn't say it to undercut my joy. But see, I need to remember that this book, that my life is really built on a tower of pain, right? And if I forget that for a moment, then I won't be able to walk away, to walk in the world the way I need to, to do honor to victims, to mothers who suffer so much for what their sons do, to fathers who suffer so much for what their sons forget. So. You know, me and my mom have a good relationship now, but it's so strained by 
an eight year absence that you know can never be recovered and I would rather not have a book you know I would rather not have a nightmares I would rather my mom not have a nightmares even though it's great honestly to stand before y'all and have people feel like I have a gift and applaud what I'm doing I would rather not have all of that than to have a, you know the memory of my mom just being in the courtroom you know devastated He got the mic and then I, I'll answer your question. If you were a king, what kind of policies would you set up to, so that you would, would never have committed the carjacking? I, I listen to Congressman Bobby Scott. You know, I know, no, I mean, and, and I say that, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, a little bit facetious, right? But the truth is, every time I've heard him speak, I had no idea people lived this earth who were willing to be that honest. Because he has to get elected, you know what I'm saying? And that's the type of honesty that doesn't get you elected. But, but clearly, it has gotten him elected. And what I mean by that is, I was 16 years old, really college-bound, and had never met anybody in my community who went to college. I never met anybody in my community who was a professional. Now, these people existed, but it's not programs necessarily set up or, or ways set up so that these people know that their stories are important, that their impact on young folks are important. There aren't even ways in which people can be actively employed to provide services that people with means get based on their birth. And so if I say what could have happened, you know, to help me, it's something as simple as us paying attention to a policy like that, which which, which would catch up some kids who aren't what you call at risk, but who sort of on the borderline like me and will help us develop. I mean the guy, um, Evan Hawkins, he had a program where he's taking these kids around Richmond seeing I didn't know that the Freedom Bureau was in Richmond. And I know that we could probably go to any school in Richmond and gather up 40 kids who don't know that the Freedom Bureau was in Richmond, who don't know that, you know, Richmond was the center of the Confederacy and all the history that goes with that and what it means to know that Richmond was once that and that Virginia, you know, voted for President Barack Obama. See, that's so all that. So if, I, if you ask me if I was king for a day, I would just say that those programs will likely make those things possible. Uh, the the, the um, young woman here had a question. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. And for you for being blessed to stand in this position. Thank you. Thank you. For eight years, I served on the Board of Correctional Education for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we traveled throughout the entire Commonwealth to every juvenile and adult facility, other people call them P-R-I-S-O-N-S. And since then, when my term ended there, I now serve on the advisory committee of the Department of Juvenile Justice. And all I have to offer you is praise and thank God. And you can say, as is recorded in Psalm 6820, blessed be God who has heard me, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. God bless you and continue to strengthen you. Thank you. My name is Jeanette Drake, and I also want to uh, second your blessing, second her blessings, the God's blessings upon you. I used to work with um, students who were incarcerated between the ages of 8 and 18 in uh, Washington, D.C. and Maryland, so I, I know what that system is like. Um, my question to you, and maybe this is a little premature, um, has to do with two things. One, when you were in high school, um, in middle school and high school, you obviously read a lot and all of that. And it sounds like that was part of what helped, quote, save you. Um, as, a, as a writer, as, quote, an emerging writer, have you given any thought to the kinds of things that you want to write in, in years to come? So, I know it's kind of early now because you're, you know, you're um, on the book tour and all of that. Um, but, no, I mean, yes, yes and no. You know, sort of, I write poetry all the time and I'm in an MFA program, which, you know, forces me to, to, to write and, and to think critically about poems in a way that is not necessarily creative writing, but influences the creative process. 
and I hope that, you know, I, I pray that, like, if you look at the book, you see James Baldwin, you see Yusuf Komiyaki, you see Arthur Ashe, you see a lot of people who build their lives, and I want to model my life around, like, a writer like James Baldwin. And I know that I have a particular story to tell. I know that this thing happened to me and it's important. And I know that I can talk about sort of some issues around prison. But in the future, I hope to be able to expand that and talk about, you know, I mean, it's a joy to have a son. You know, and that, and that right there is like a lesson that I learn every day. And so I hope to some way find a way to, to write that story and to write these other stories about the things that's going on in my community and to think critically about, you know, how to improve different things. So I hope that, you know, my writing, I have a poetry book coming out next year, which is largely about prison, but I hope that from this point, you know, my writing will be able to expand out and come back in, you know, expand out and come back in. So we need to look for uh, non-fiction and fiction and poetry. Yes, non-fiction, right. fiction, poetry. You might find me writing some stuff on the back of Milton Cartons, you know, <laughs> newspaper clippings, everything. Praise God. I actually joined with the young lady in the front and just thanking God for what he's done for you. Um, I actually lead a Bible study at Brunswick County Jail on Tuesday nights. And, and I'd like to ask you, um, are there any specific words of encouragement that you you would recommend that I pass on? Uh, well, your specific words of encouragement would be that, actually, I will quote the song that she just read. But, um, and also, Specifically, I would just say that a lot of times people tell you what it is you can do and what it is you can be. And we never have control of those messages. But we have absolute control over how hard we work to become what it is that we want to be. And we may not even have control over whether or not we succeed, but we always have control over the work. And you'll find the people who are successful in life took advantage of that control more than the people who aren't successful. And prison, you know, as, as, as much as these statistics are, as much as these statistics are true, prison, in the case of the guilty, always begins with a choice. They can make another choice. I could have made another choice. So, uh, just a quick question: Have you reconnected with your father since? Man. <laughs> Okay, never mind. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna say this real quick story, right? So I was when I was commencement speaker, I drove to DC, right, to give my father some tickets to the graduation. And leaving there, I got lost, right? And pulled over to ask a cop for directions. And so my seatbelt wasn't on at the time because I was basically two minutes you no, know, no, I was two minutes away from, 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 from like starting my car. That's why my seatbelt wasn't on. I said, How do I get to the main street? He said, What you doing around here? What? I said, so then I said, look, look, sir, I was the first person in my family to go to prison. I'm the first person to graduate from college. I just wanted to get my father these tickets so that he could come. And the thing is, you probably think my father went to prison too, but I usually don't count him as part of my, my family, unfortunately, right? But long story short, gave him the tickets. I got a ticket when I gave him the tickets, right? <laughs> and some points on my license for asking for help. Anyway, my father didn't show up at the graduation, which, which was very disappointing for me. So. You know, the long story short is, you know, we try, we try, we try, and sometimes, you know, the bridge works both ways in the sense that it, it's a struggle for me to forgive myself and to forgive him for his absence, but I think it's also a struggle for him to forgive himself for his absence and forgive me for the way that, you know, I'm not pressing to be in his life as maybe a son should. Again, thank you to uh, Mr. Dwayne Betts for being with us tonight and for sharing with us. Didn't he do a marvelous job? And, and not only to share such a, a difficult and painful story, but to tell it so well. I'm so glad that we had an opportunity to bring you here to the Library of Virginia. So on behalf of the state librarian, Dr. Sandy Treadway, and all of the staff here, we just want to say thank you for being a part, all of the co-sponsors. Uh, at this point, before we break out and head out into the, uh, the foyer for the reception, and for the book signing, we have an opportunity um, for all of you to have a chance to win a copy of Dwayne's book this evening. So Dwayne, if you'd come up and do me the honor of putting your hand in the box.
And then right after this, um, Andrew Glock has another announcement. He will come up to the stage. You want to? You need to read this. Can't give away your books, sir. <laughs> okay. So, well, Barbara Bowes from Richmond, Virginia, please stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Virginia, again, thank you for coming. Please come again. And uh, Congressman Scott, appreciate you being here. Uh, have a good evening.